Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 215th New Social Environment. I'm Anya Bernstein, a production assistant at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and the privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between publisher of Siglio Press, Lisa Pearson, and Brooklyn Rail editor-at-large, Constance Lou Allen. We're also thrilled to have the poet Adam DeGraff here who will read to close today's program. To begin, I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners of Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters on which we stand. Finally, the Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprisings in response to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McAtee, James Skurlock, Jamil Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Rayshard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Toyin Salau, Walter Wallace Jr., and countless others we have lost to white supremacy and police violence in this country. We acknowledge that justice will come from the streets, from the nation demanding accountability and refusing to move on until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. Before I introduce our host and guest, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce today's host. Uh, Constance Llewellyn is adjunct curator at the University of California Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. As Matrix curator there from 1980 to 88, she organized over 75 small contemporary art exhibitions. A senior curator from 98 to 2007, she curated many major exhibitions, most recently Stephen Kaltenbach, The Beginning and the End for the Minetti Shrem Museum at UC Davis. She is the author of 500 Cap Street, David Ireland's House, and co-author with Dor Bowen, Bowen of Bruce Nauman, Spatial Encounters, both published by UC Press. She is editor-at-large for the Brooklyn Rail. Lisa Pearson is a publisher, editor, and designer, as well as the founder of Siglio Press, an independent, pu independent publishing house driven by its feminist ethos and com committed to publishing uncommon books that live at the intersection of art and literature. She lives and works in the Hudson River Valley, New York. So without further ado, Akani, take it away. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, Brooklyn Rail, for always uh, being so welcoming and for this amazing series. Um, Lisa, I want to add to your bio by saying that the 2020 Siglio publications received several accolades, including in Book Forum's Outstanding Art Book of the Year for Felix Gonzalez Torres, Photostats, and Holland Cotter selected Ray Johnson's Frog Pond Splash as one of the best art books of the year. And the Madeline Jin's Reader and Memory were on the Brooklyn Rails 2020 Best Art Book list. So, to start with, Lisa, the dictionary definition of Siglio is an inverse to a boundary, a small unauthorized marble as opposed to an ecclesiastically recognized miracle, and the tongue-like organ of a bee. I especially like the third, but not sure how it applies. Maybe you could tell us. Um, yeah, I, I actually had worked uh, very hard to create um, what I thought would be an ever-changing dictionary definition. Anya, can you pull up slide three, actually? I think that's got the whole thing on it. There it is. Um, you know, Siglio is really about the uncategorizable spaces between art and literature, image and text, and the visual and the literary. And I had wanted this, this definition to change monthly. Um, I'm a one-person operation, so that became somewhat impossible, but I hope you know, that by definition, Siglio is itself mutable and that this definition suggests expansiveness and my commitment to wonder and to incongruity. And as for bees, when I was naming Siglio, I really was trying to use the bee and things that were around bees as a possibility for the name and that didn't happen. So I wanted bees to be a part of Siglio in some way. And, and it's not just because of sort of the obvious metaphors, but the thing that I love about bees, this species that just never fails to inspire marvel that um, is always at the edge of our understanding um, and imagination. I mean, there are just things that, you know, scientists tell us about how bees see color and light and chart distance. And, 
it's just almost impossible to imagine how they actually do that and then communicate those things through their dance inside their hive. And the other thing about bees um, that is rather amazing to me are these stories that have been told for millennia to explain them and the making of honey and their behavior. And those stories are almost invariably wrong. And that sort of brings me quite obliquely to something else that's really important to Siglio, which is this, this idea about not being right, about sort of embracing wrongness in some way. And there's a quote from William Kentridge uh, that I take as kind of a mantra, let us for once not be right. And um, there's another mantra I have. I have a stamp on my desk that says, you're fighting a losing battle. So those two, <laughs> those two things. On that note, <laughs> as has been mentioned, you're both the editor, the publisher, and the designer. And if I remember at first, you were also the PR person and the shipper. In other words, you were like a one-man band. Is this still the case? Um, it is. I, I, I do all of those things. Um, I edit, design, production, manage. I do all the publicity. I have a phenomenal distributor art book, DAP, Distribute Siglio Books, which means they get out into the world. Um, and then, of course, every book is a collaboration in some way. And I'm really fortunate to work with amazing people. So, for example, Lucy Ives edited the Madeline Ginn's Reader. Elizabeth Zuba has edited several books for Siglio. Um, Michael Duncan um, edited the Jess book. Uh, and then I've co-edited. And then, of course, most of the books are collaborations with the artists if they're alive. And that's, you know, perhaps the, the most joyous part of what I do. Well, there's so much to talk about, but um, we decided to start our conversation with a brief description of a forthcoming book titled It Is What It Is by Richard Kraft, which will be available this summer. Uh, this couldn't be timelier since it's based on the Trump presidency. And of course, tomorrow is, thank goodness, the inauguration. So um, before we continue with your other books, all 40, I think that you've published, although we can't talk about all of them, unfortunately. Lisa, tell us a little bit about this book that will be available in the summer and which will be discussed in one of these events for Blue Book and Real, I think February 26th. Yes, so Richard Kraft, the artist, uh, and Monica De La Torre, the poet, will talk about this, I think as part of the uh, Printed Matter Virtual Art Book Fair in Brooklyn Rails event in that, but um, I will say, <laughs> I will say tomorrow, Richard Kraft is, is along with all of us, we are all very happy that this presidency is almost over. He has been assigning since the first day, since inauguration on Jan January 20th, 2017, he's been giving Trump colored cards like a ref in a soccer match. So he started with yellow and red and a yellow is a warning. A red is you're supposedly thrown out of the game if you get a red and clearly uh, this hasn't worked um, because there are now 10,000 cards and about 500,000 words of notations for each of the cards. Um, he started the project to really refuse Trump's normalization um, and to uh, for himself to, to never um, become inured to whatever Trump was doing. Um, but the whole project is sort of undergirded with a kind of futility and absurdity. I mean, these cards have absolutely zero effect and power can, you know, persists with impunity. Um, uh, but Richard for every day of the last four years has spent time scouring Trump's Twitter feed. He's consulted various news sources. He assigns cards um, and then writes the notations. Um, and if you scroll on you for the next three, you can see sort of how the cards accumulate. Um, all right, yeah, that. So that's, this is one month of Trump's presidency. That's the very first month of Trump's presidency. There's about 40 cards on each spread. Um, and there are yellow and red, and then he added magenta uh, for more egregious transgressions. He also added orange for the visits to Trump's golf clubs, that when Trump went to visit one of his clubs, and pink for the sycophants who played golf with him. He also <laughs> added dark blue 
for the, the, what he calls fuck you as you go cards. And these are for the people who are resigned, uh, who are fired or resigned from the administration. And then there are teal cards for acts of resistance. Um, and the first book is about 1100 cards for 2017. 2018 becomes, I don't know, I think almost 1800, almost 2000 cards. 2019 doubles that. It's almost, I think it's almost 3000 cards. And then 2020 will actually be two volumes. Uh, so there's a book for each year and then except for 2020, there's a book for the cards and a book for the text because there are, um, I don't know, over 5,000 cards this last year. So if we can go to the next slide, you can see um, this is just January 6th, the day that the mob stormed the Capitol. And in 2020, Richard added new colors. He added purple when Trump suggested injecting bleach uh, into your body to um, you know, cure the coronavirus. And so there have been many, many purple cards for all kinds of transgressions since then. And then in September, when Trump uh, refused to agree to a peaceful transfer of power, he added crimson. Um, so the last four months, really since September, have been, you know, I think we started a Kickstarter campaign to raise money to do this. And in, in September, there were about 8,000 cards and for all four years. And he's added another 2,000 cards just in the last few months of the presidency um, this last year. So, so Richard, <laughs> Richard's, Richard's life will be utterly changed tomorrow. No right. longer will he wake up in the morning and have to be confronted with the sewage of Trump's yeah. Twitter feed. Um, what I would, yeah, what I would say one other thing about this piece that, you know, what I really love, and maybe you noticed when it scrolled through with the cards is that it is also about um, something beautiful. And, and that was the only way Richard could survive this was to yeah. take something That's really toxic. Say. He took something extremely ugly and turned it into something visual and beautiful. Um, let's move on, however, <laughs> to the early days of Siglio. Um, your first publication, which actually is what brought us together as friends, was Joe Brainerd's The Nancy Book. So we could maybe get to the next image. Um, you first heard of Brainerd, as, I, as you've recorded, we, uh, you've told me, was in 2004 in Naropa in Boulder, Colorado, where the Brainerd retrospective that I had curated for Berkeley was being shown at the Boulder Art Museum. And you heard my late husband, the poet Bill Bergson and friend of Brainerd's with whom he often collaborated. Um, you speak, there's, I think there's a, another image coming up of the collaboration, but anyway, um, which, um, inspired you to go further, to learn more about Brainerd. You talked, of course, to Ron Paget, Brainerd's lifelong friend and, and supporter, uh, and also came to meet me since I had done this exhibition. Um, so Nancy, of course, was the um, most popular comic strip when Brainerd was growing up. And he was able to mimic Ernie Bushmiller's graphic style absolutely to perfection. He somehow identified with Nancy and often put her in X-rated situations. There she is as a boy. <laughs> oh, and then if you, Anya, if you go to the next slide, the really X-rated one is there. That's the that's the collaboration, collaboration with Bill. Bill. <laughs> yeah, you know, don't look too, too closely, or maybe <laughs> I love this one. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, he also put Nancy into classic works of art. Let's go to the next image where she's the head of the new Descending the Stair, Duchamp. And she, he also renders her in the style of um, important artists like de Kooning, as you see there on the left. So um, you had told me that this is one of your most popular books. You know, it's, it's not the best seller, but it's definitely the most beloved book. And when I'm at book fairs and people come to my table, they will point, they will actually, they will not even see Siglio and they'll see, you know, they won't be, they won't notice the table, but they'll notice the Nancy book standing up, uh, you know, on a stand and they will point at it. And then they will look at me and they will put their hand on their heart. And then they will come over and tell me how much they love this book. Um, it, it means so much to people. And, um, 
you know, and, and that this book actually sets the tone for the press, that it was the first book out of the gate um, is kind of, for me, you know, really uh, talismanic in a way. Um, it, it's so full of play. It's so full of wonder. And the other thing, which, you know, I just, I had this, I really, I did not know what I was doing as a publisher. Ron Padgett was incredibly sweet to sort of take me on and mentor me and um, uh, the goodwill and the love for Joe and the generosity around getting this book into the world. You know, I mean, I came to see you, Connie, in your office at Berkeley, I remember, and I met Bill after being blown away by that lecture and everybody was so incredibly helpful. And, um, you know, that book, this book is sort of, it, it's drenched in love for Joe and, and that generosity. That's something that's so nice to hear. And I, you know, of the shows that I've done, the many shows, this is the one um, that I think I've gotten the most uh, response to, uh, especially from artists, which is always very gratifying. Now on a completely different note, and we can move the next to the next slide. Um, um, the Torture of Women by Nancy Spiro, which, um, you had seen installed because of course it was created as an installation for gallery or museum viewing. Was it the wax show at, at um, LA MOCA? And the, the problem with that was that the way the, it's a huge, it's a huge series of, of images that are meant of course to be read, but the way they were stacked vertically in Los Angeles made it really sort of impossible to read which of course is uh, ironic because uh, the whole idea of it was to talk about all these different ways that women have undergone this kind of torture. So you translated it into a book form and tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so, so what you're looking at is the first panel of 14 panels and the entire piece together when it's installed horizontally in a gallery. So panel to panel to panel to panel it's about 120 feet long. And at WAC, which, I mean, I cannot tell you the, how, how angry I was to walk into a show that was about feminist work in which they rendered this completely illegible except for the panels that, um, you know, were at eye line or lower where you would have to crouch. And, Anya, if you can go to the next one, actually, um, you can see that this, this text uh, is really meant to be read. So what Nancy did in Torture of Women was she took uh, reportage, she took Amnesty International first person testimony, she took um, ancient creation and destruction myths and gave voice to the silenced, these women who had been severely abused um, as torture victims uh, by their states. Um, this book, by the way, was released just as um, the revelations about Abu Ghraib came out. Uh, this book was published in 2010 and they came out in 20, uh, 2009. Um, and Nancy, as a feminist artist and as a very political artist, really wanted people to understand um, the body and, and, and the role of power on the body through women, thinking that that might change the way we understand the universal. But if the universal was something that was feminized, that, that would shift our perceptions. Um, so in this case, not only did I want people to read it, so each section of the book opens with the panel, so you can see the full panel, but then on, if you can click through, uh, the next three, you can see that things are repeated. So they sort of stutter and then they change in scale so that they're enlarged and you can really enter the piece in a different way as a reader. So when I'm taking a work that is uh, originates as an installation, I really see my role as a translator. So do I have to think about what I'm losing um, by taking the relationship between the viewer and the work um, into a space of reader and book. Um, and that's 
you know, in this case, that was one way to do that. And if you move to the next slide, one of the other sort of features of this piece is its great expanses of emptiness. Um, and they really stand in for the silence, for the, for the things that, that can't be said or articulated. Um, and, you know, it's not typical to put a bunch of blank space in the book, in a book, but that was really important to this project. And, and also seeing, you can see sort of the rougher edges and the pin marks and, and the creases in the paper as well. So that was also very important to that sort of aspect of the translation. Yes, and I worked with Nancy and, and she was just an incredible person and artist. And also I showed work of her husband, Leon Golub, and the two were making political art at a time when people were not, it was not yeah. completely, you know, acceptable within the mainstream art world. But they actually lived their convictions and really incredible. She was um, amazing. I feel so lucky that I got to work with her um, just at the end great. of her life. So let me just say that if Nancy was one of your most beloved books, this was one of your least popular. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, at the time that this book came out, I was doing my own distribution. So that meant calling all the bookstores that I thought would stock Siglio books. And I had a long chat with a guy at St. Mark's and he said, this is just not going to sell because nobody wants to buy a book called Torture of Women. Um, I think he did actually, you know, I, I said, but Nancy's in your neighborhood. She's, you know, she is, you know, the, you know, the Lower East Side. And, and so finally, I think they did sell some, but, um, <laughs> you know, I think she's really underrated. Um, and I think that, you know, Robert Storr uh, wrote a really nice thing for the book about how her work in speaking truth to power, and I'm paraphrasing terribly here, but how her work in speaking truth to power is complex and 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 sophisticated in a way that is you know multi-layered and there's so much to mine there and and i i think she will get her due um but one of my jobs as the publisher of siglio is to make space for works that you know aren't seen that aren't read and this particular work was not included in her moma ps1 retrospective um which is, which is really shocking <laughs> which was really disappointing but made me feel like that's again why i did the book and why i wanted that book to happen yes well another uh, in a similar vein that is taking a, a project that was meant to be uh, an installation and translating it as we have said into a book is your recent publication of Bernadette Mayer's uh, Memory, which um, another massive project. Um, she embarked on this experiment for in 1971, where for one month she exposed a roll of 35 millimeter film and kept a daily journal. And finally, uh, she ended with 1100 photographs, 200 pages of text and six hours of audio recordings. And this was shown, this whole project was shown at the Holly Solomon Gallery in 72, but then again, not again, until 2016 at the Poetry Foundation, and then finally at uh, the Lower East Side Gallery Canada in 2017. So as I said, this is another translation of an installation into a book. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, I think, you know, whenever I do these kinds of things, I'm thinking about, you know, the forms and how the forms are language themselves and the way in which, um, you know, what, what equivalences there are and what can be, what's inevitably going to be lost and what can be gained. And, and particularly with this book, I mean, you gain it with every book in this kind of translation, but particularly with memory, what you get is time. So if you went to the Canada installation and you can go to the next one, there you go. You can see that this is a grid of 1100 photographs, uh, 1100 plus photographs. I think it's about 36 feet long and about four or five feet high. Um, you would hear audio. If you stayed in the gallery for six hours, you could hear Bernadette read the entire book. Um, and Marie Warsh, Bernadette's daughter, told me, because I didn't get a chance to see the show, she said that people would walk. They would start at the far left and they would walk the entire length of the wall, look at the top row of photographs, and then walk back and look at the next row of photographs, just like a typewriter carriage return. And so as you're, as you're looking at each photograph and you're seeing them in sequence, 
you're hearing Bernadette's audio, but they don't necessarily correspond, right? Um, so one of the things that, that when I was working with Bernadette, which I was really lucky, again, as with Nancy, to be able to sort of talk through the translation with the author, with the artist, um, you know, was how do we both use sequence to govern the work um, so that people really understand that linearity and they can follow Bernadette's uh, line of, you know, where her eye travels, but also in the text. But at the same time, if you turn the page um, to the next one, preserving the grid too. So the, where there are sort of chance juxtapositions of things. Um, so I think that, that, that we accomplished that. The other thing that we get in time, because you can now like read this. And last summer, there was a daily reading at Poets House where uh, every day a poet read from the corresponding day in July. So that was another sort of aspect of time that was sort of impossible in a, in a gallery space. Um, and then the other thing in the translation that, that I think was really important here is color. So um, if you go back actually on you to the grid for just a second, so you can kind of see in some of these that there's a magenta cast and then you go forward again to the next one. Um, these looked really different in, they look somewhat different in the, in the original installation because Bernadette shot slide film and then she, for the installation, had that those, uh, that those slides developed into snapshots. And because lots of her images were over and underexposed, they had, some of them had a magenta cast, some of them were blown out. And I asked Bernadette if she wanted to uh, replicate how the images looked in the installation or if she wanted me to color correct uh, and bring out as much detail as possible. And she chose the latter. So what you get in the book memory is really kind of closer to what Bernadette actually saw than what was in, in the installation. So that was sort of another gain, I think. Yeah, that, that's great. Do we have other images of this yeah, book? Yeah, if you can keep going, there's um, a few more. So here in this case, you can see sort of her eye and all the, the juxtapositions. And then if you keep going, um, so in this one, uh, this sort of, there are a number of full bleeds throughout the book. So here's this set of on the grid opening up July 21st, and then you turn the page and there's a full bleed on the next image um, of inside the car. I mean, you're sort of looking outside and now you're inside. And those full bleeds were also almost sort of chance determined because everything had to go in sequence. And so it was just a question of when and where we could have a full bleed. And sometimes there was only one choice. Sometimes there were multiple choices. And I asked Bernadette, you know, give her which one she had a choice of. And it was great to let her sort of configure that to make, you know, whatever small window there was of um, within that constraint for her to choose. I think we have one more, maybe one more. Yeah, there's one more. So yeah, this, yeah, and I love this one. Um, and and I just want to say too that that this book, Marcella Duran, the poet, wrote something really nice and hyperallergic uh, in her review of it. And she talked about having worked at the Poetry Project and that this work was legendary, that people hadn't seen it, um, and that it was really unpublishable. And, and, and that's what excited me. <laughs> I mean, I published actually a bit of this, and we'll talk about this book next um, or in a, in a couple of uh, minutes. But I published an excerpt of this, and it is almost that, a collection of image text work by women artists and writers, because Connie Bill had pointed me in the direction of memory. And, um, you know, when someone says it's unpublishable, then I'm intrigued. Well, publish it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm right there. I am interested. What do you mean? <laughs> um, and, now it's a, and now it's actually a thing. And, and yet, what I want to just say, it's gotten so much press attention and people are so excited about it. And I'm over the moon because it is an incredibly radical work. Um, Bernadette talks in her introduction about all the things that are not in the book. There are 1,100 photographs. There's 200 pages of text. And she's right. There's so much that's not in there. But what I love about it is that you feel like you've dreamt it or sort of remembered it somehow or maybe imagined it. And that all of 
you know, it's everything that's there, but also what's in between the lines and in between the snapshots. It's, it's a really extraordinary piece. Well, um, let's move to the next project, which is very, very different. Uh, this yes. is called The Dress Book, and it's by the French uh, conceptual artist Sophie Carl. Uh, it's um, quite different because uh, it actually wanted to be a book, if I can say that. It was a project that Carl conducted for over a month where she had found an address book on the street. And she decided to try to reconstruct this man's life by going to all the people in the address book and asking them about him. So it was a kind of way of doing a portrait. By the way, and you, you reminded me of this, she did send the book back to the owner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Sophie is kind of a, a conceptual detective, I guess you could say, who is, you know, always trying to sort of um, unravel uh, people's lives and through their, you know, through their possessions and so forth. I mean, like you'd never really want her to house sit for you. you no. Know? <laughs> <laughs> so let's go to the to the next next image from this book. Yeah. So this was originally published as a sort of serial in the French uh, liberal newspaper, Libération. Um, and she had promised the uh, man whose book this was uh, that she would never make it a book until he was no longer around. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So he was actually on vacation in August when she started her serial in Libération. And when he got back from vacation, uh, and discovered that she had you know, surveilled his life, really. Um, he was very upset. Supposedly he demanded a reciprocal invasion of privacy um, and they published, uh, Sophie gave Liberation some nude photographs of hers that she had done for a performance called Striptease. And so they published those. And then she promised Pierre that she would not publish this as a book until he died. And, I actually asked for an excerpt of this for the book we're going to talk about next. It is almost that. And she said, no, I don't want to do it as an excerpt. I only want to do it as a book. And I then said, well, can I do it? And um, she said, yes, which, you know, blew my mind. I mean, I've, I just noticed that in the chat, people are saying how much this book means to them. Well, I'm right there with you. Uh, Sophie was a huge influence on why I even started Siglio. So that she said yes to this um, was, uh, was, was, was thrilling to say the least for me. And I've been lucky to do another book with her, Sweet Nitienne, and I'm working on something else with her now too, which is really exciting. Um, well, yeah. as you mentioned, you originally had approached her to be included in this book uh, called It Is Almost That. I mean, in your mission statement, you have said and you continue to, to promote the idea of women artists and writers. And of course, this is a great example of that. It's a, a book that includes work by many, many contemporary artists like Eleanor Anton, Adrienne Piper, Teresa Hak Yung Cha. In fact, it's a piece of Teresa Hak Yung Cha's that serves as the title of the book. It is almost that. And then you you end with um, uh, Charlotte Solomon, who was um, hiding from the Nazis in the early early 40s and created this series of port of paintings. And then she unfortunately, um, they, they found her and she was eventually killed. Um, so this is a historical figure. And I think that's how you end the book. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So, so it is almost that's really the heart of Siglio. Um, and, and I would say that if I did this book now, it would be a completely different book. I mean, this book was published in 2011. At the time, there were very, very few books on image text. There were maybe three or four and they you know, they didn't give space for the work to unfold. They had sort of documents or evidence of um, image text works. Uh, and, and, and often there were just a few women that were represented in those books, Barbara um, Kruger, Jenny Holzer, um, sometimes Nancy Spiro. Uh, and this book was trying to do a, a number of different things. One was to just, on the, and on the simplest sort of feminist terms of making space for work 
that had not been given space. Um, it was again, you know, sort of back to the idea of time and legibility to make works legible. So if you go to the next one, um, the next slide is Adrienne Piper, which was which are two of her political self portraits, and I include all of them in the book. And the book actually opens with this series um, because one of the things that you know, if you had an opportunity to see these, I I think I saw them maybe at the Walker originally. Um, most people would not stand there in the gallery and read the entire text. Um, and inside of a book, then they, they give you time to read them. And it's really important to read them. I mean, this is, this is work that goes to the heart of everything that she does, that is the intertwining of the personal and the political. You know, there's stories about growing up as uh, light-skinned African-American and what the effects of that have been on her sort of experience and thinking. And, um, you know, they're, they're beautiful and moving and profound. And, and I just, <laughs> just got the impression that nobody really read them. Yeah. So that was, that was one part of it. So then the other part of it was to, um, brush different works up against each other in different ways. So to, to askew sort of typical art historical categories or literary categories and instead create conversations and frictions between works um, so that new kinds or different kinds of relationships could emerge. Um, and if we go to the next slide, which is Teresa Hot Kung Cha. And Connie, by the way, the, all the artists that you said are, were pivotal you know, they were really the cornerstones of the book. Adrian, I knew I wanted Adrian Piper. I knew I wanted Teresa Hot Kung Cha, Charlotte Solomon and Eleanor Anton in this book. I asked Sophie and she said no. <laughs> so she was, she was also pivotal, but she ended up with her own book and I had just published Nancy Spiro. So I felt like I had given Nancy lots of space. Um, but this, Teresa, go ahead. No, I was just going to say this piece, it is almost that was um, originally a slide piece. Slide yes. piece. Yeah. So this piece, so this book uses acts of translation as well in yeah. different kinds of ways. And, you know, the thing that I love about this piece particularly and why I named the book after it is because it gets down to the sort of almost the essentials of syntax of these relationships. If you, that first image there, you and me, um, is so beautiful and feels like it just embodies what is inside and outside, what is, you know, I think, you know, when you think about it is almost that from sort of more sort of a, a, a patriarchal kind of interpretation of that would be that it's, that it's lacking, that it's insufficient. And for me, that it is almost that is all about expansiveness. It's about possibility and, and, and what can be and what is always in motion moving towards becoming. And so I love her work for that reason, because it really uses just the, the most um, uh, essential aspects. So it's just language and line here. Yeah. Well, um, so much of her work is about language or based in language. And yeah. I mean, as a person who for English was not her, her first language, uh, she has a very different relationship with language than, than someone who grew up or you know, always learned English from birth. And so she is, has a way of sort of um, distancing herself and analyzing and analyzing language. This is almost like a, a language exercise in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. I love this piece. Um, mm -hmm. Anya, can you go to the next one? So Louise Bourgeois is also one of, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine that there's anybody tuning in right now who doesn't love Louise Bourgeois, but this is a piece he complete, uh, he disappeared into complete silence and had never been reproduced in full before. Um, so this one was not a translation. It was just prints. Uh, if you go to the next one is I think the Carrie Mae Weems. This was a photo text piece that I worked with Carrie uh, to sort of translate into onto the page here. And um, uh, it's from Sea Island series about photographs of this place in on the islands off of South Carolina and Georgia where the slave trade was really sort of, I mean, it was sort of a, a landing point. And she uses um, myths and superstitions to sort of in, bring to life what is really a sort of 
a clearly deathly sort of situation there. Um, and then the next one, I think is Eleanor Anton. Yes. So, uh, you know, there is the very serious in this book. And then there is the extremely funny, which is Eleanor Anton's um, <laughs> graphs of her conversations with her mother. So all of that represents the emotional tenor of their conversation. <laughs> and, uh, and I love this piece. Um, and I saw, I saw her, there was her piece carving was at that wax show. Um, right. <laughs> but th this was the piece that I wanted for the book. It um, wonderful. And, then, and, it doesn't, and it doesn't get a lot of exposure, so it's great. <laughs> no, I'm not sure. I mean, I don't think it was, you know, because she also did the Eleonora Antonova pieces, which right. I could have included. But uh, LACMA had done a book of those, and that was pretty available. Um, and then I think the last slide might be Charlotte Solomon. Yes. Yeah. So... Charlotte Solomon, um, you know, if I had had, you know, they, somebody just, a French publisher just republished the entire um, set of about 800 gouaches with another several hundred uh, overlays. Some of them have text written uh, into the painting. Some of them are gouaches with an overlay with text written over them. And this is a, a, Gener multi-generational history of a Jewish family in Germany, um, starting with before World War I and leading up through the rise of the Nazis. And um, it, is, it is a complex novel uh, in image and text. And I think it's one of the great works of the 20th century. And it is just not known and not read and not engaged in the way that I think it should be. So I reproduced an entire chapter. There's about 20 pages or so from this book. Um, in it is almost that, and it ends the book um, as really a testament to this extraordinary um, creativity and intelligence um, that Charlotte Solomon had that was just that was decimated at Auschwitz. Yeah. Um, so. Well, on a more hopeful note, um, let's talk about um, Tantra Song. This is yes. another book that um, I think has been very well received. Um, this is this is probably my this this is without a doubt my most popular book. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm glad I had something to do with it. You um, did. You did. It's Tantra Song, and it reproduces several beautiful tantric images that were collected by the late French poet Franck André Jam, two of which you saw in our house, my house and Bill's house, that inspired you to make the book. Um, and of course, these images, which of course have nothing to do with modern and contemporary art, but they do appeal to our Western sensibility and their, their beautiful abstract uh, simplicity. So um, let's talk a little bit about the story of how these came to be. Yeah, so um, I was at your house and you, you told me, you know, follow me, follow me. And you led me up a landing and there were two paintings on the wall that um, were just so extraordinary and they just radiated energy. And then you and Bill told me about Franck's story. And, um, and there's an interview that Bill did for the book uh, with Franck that if anybody has the book, they'll know that this will be sort of, that they will have known the story. But Franck had discovered um, these very pared down tantric paintings in a little book uh, about tantric painting with poems by Pablo Neruda at a bouquiniste in Paris. And he set off to India in search for them and he found none. Um, and then he was in just an awful bus accident that killed several people. Uh, he had several bones broken. He was sent home, um, I think in a kind of medicinal hammock of some kind that they rigged for him on the plane. And then he spent a year in bed, really. I think he was editing Rene Char's journals at the time, if I'm remembering this correctly. Um, but he was undeterred and he went back to India. Somebody had given him the name of a soothsayer. And uh, he tells the story of seeing this man and being asked to wash his hands, you know, in sand for 10 minutes. And at the end, the man tells him that, that uh, he has he has paid sufficient tribute uh, to, I think, Shakti was the, the god that was invoked, and, uh, and he'll find what he's looking for. And Franck probably had a very Gallic shrug as he left, and 
you know, a few minutes later, somebody ran after him with his first address and he was introduced to these communities of Tantricas who paint these images. Some of them are actually, you know, people who identify themselves as artists, but the making of these images for them is not art making. It's, it's, it's a meditative practice. And then the images are used to shape uh, the meditative practice of people who are looking at them. And of course we are all acolytes and, you know, do not access these images in the same way. But, okay. but that said, um, you know, I had all of these images in my house when we were doing this book and, um, and then they were shown at the Santa Monica Museum of Art in this very tiny room. And I would go and I would stand in that room and people would come in and they would just gravitate to one image or another and just stand there in front of it for a very long time as if that image spoke to them so um, directly and 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 it was amazing and 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 you know this book is the most popular book because it goes from artist to artist to artist it's always a gift people seem to give their I, I'm constantly getting emails from people oh I gave my book away I have to get another one <laughs> I have um, several just for that reason but yeah. yeah but you know um I understand that most of the artists who made these or non-artists were women just to remind uh, Mark on that. And also the fact that once these images were used in whatever context, it's sort of in a spiritual, meditative or religious context, they were no longer of use. And that's why the, the people who made them were willing to give them or sell them to An Franck Andre Jean. We discovered these, Bill and I, in an exhibition that Larry Rinder had done, I think it was at CCA. And you know, it said on the label, collection of Franck Andre Jean or some, you know, words, and we we got in touch with Larry and that was how we got in touch with Franck and then we all became friends. And um, and I think the idea was that um, he was permitted to, Franck that is, to sell these to keep himself going financially, but not to enrich himself. Right. And I think that's sort of been his, his practice. He yeah. goes, every few years or had gone there. He died only this last year. So yeah. Anyway, it's it's a really so beautiful book. You can really see why it was one of your most or it was your most popular, I guess I could say. Yeah. Um so I, if you go through the next couple of slides, you can see there's a few more from the book. They're just yeah. Yeah, they're just, they're so beautiful. And, you know, and I, I'll also say too, I mean, you put me in touch with Frank and we did this whole book over email. And, uh, you know, I, I wrote a little thing when he died in September um, about how he came to visit me after we did the book. And of course, you know, neither of us had any idea that this book would be in its fifth printing. I mean, you know, uh, Fifth, uh, fifth. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it just went into its fifth printing this wow. summer. And, um, you know, I printed 2000 to begin with and they sold out in six or eight weeks and Frank and I were just kind of flabbergasted. We just had no idea. Um, and when he came to visit, um, and I, and I wonder, you know, I imagine that you, um, yeah, well, I'm just gonna see a quote from Michael tweet saying, I told you it was going to be a big success. Well, Michael's a translator and um, Michael, thank you for being here. Um, and, and, and I think you're right, you knew, you, I think you were the only one who knew. <laughs> I well, you should... know, it was very funny, Bill invited him to come and give a talk at the San Francisco Art Institute <clears throat> where Bill organized the speaker series and he came with a portfolio of these beautiful paintings and I can't remember why this was, maybe he just not a name that people knew, but very, very few people showed up in the lecture hall. The lecture hall holds about 200 people. So he was undeterred and he just opened, he opened his satchel and spread them all, what he had all out on the table. And the 10 people that were there could come down and actually look at them. Oh yeah. Them as slides, you know, and talk to Frank. It was just such a wonderful experience. And he was fine with it, you know, that it hadn't been, in the sense popular, but it was so special. I mean, I yeah. guess looking in on this now, we're there at that time and we'll attest to this. Yeah, well, and what I was gonna say too was that when Frank arrived in Los Angeles and stayed with my husband and I, and my husband and me for, you know, I don't know, a week, a couple of weeks, 
you know, we just, the friendship was just sort of sealed immediately. I mean, it was, um, that's the other thing about Siglio that um, is such a gift is, I mean, this book is a gift and my friendship with Franck was a gift. And, you know, the, the, the things that happen relationship wise because of these books are all gifts, including, including getting to talk to you, Connie, which I really appreciate. <laughs> I just want to ask you a couple of general questions. Um, I know you accept um, submissions. Some of these are, you know, unsolicited submissions. Have any of these actually made it into publication? Things that people sent you that you had no idea about beforehand? Well, I, I get things all in all kinds of ways. And, and in the last four or five years, I've had to be super rigorous about, even with people I know, um, and say, please send me a query during this reading period because I'm just overwhelmed. Um, but the first book I published that came in over the transom that I, you know, it, when I started, I had to really generate all the projects myself. So I wrote to Sophie, I wrote to Nancy Spiro, I wrote to Ron Paget. Um, uh, there was a book, uh, uh, my husband had heard an interview with this guy named Dennis Wood um, on This American Life and said, wow, that would make a great book. I wrote to Dennis. Um, and then I got a query from Danielle Dutton, uh, a writer who is also a publisher. She publishes Dorothy, a publishing project with her husband, Marty Riker, which is an amazing press. Um, if, if you guys who are here don't know about it, run out and check out Dorothy. Um, but her book, Sprawl, was the first one that came in as an unsolicited query. Um, and then, you know, another book I had, uh, sort of come over the transom unexpectedly. I called Claudia Rankin for a recommendation for an intern who had applied to intern at Siglio and she was uh, that person's uh, professor. And Claudia and I were chatting about that person. And then we chatted about some friends that we had in common. And then she said, you know, I have this dear friend who has written and made this book that I think is a Siglio book. It, it's image and text. And can I read you the first five pages and I, of course, said yes, and she did, and I was blown away. And that was Karen Green's Bow Down. Um, and of course, then I've done another book with Karen. Um, so they, you know, they come in all kinds of ways. I have a conversation with friends who show me their artwork on their landing, and it becomes a book. Um, and, then, and then this year, uh, I had 200 queries come in in my summer reading period. It was an extraordinary crop of things. And I solicited 50 manuscripts that I have just now started to read. Um, and I, you know, any one of them could be a Siglio book and I will probably only be able to publish about five of them. So there'll be a lot of really, really good work that I will not be able to say yes to. But, you know, like I said about It Is Almost Out earlier, it's a really different world now than it was 10, you know, 13 years ago when I started Siglio. And I, I feel confident that you know a lot of that work will find homes. And in fact, if I think that a work feels right for any number of other presses, it's not a Siglio book anyway. You know, the, the, oh, yeah. Siglio, the Siglio book is the thing that it, uh, my initial response is, "Wow, I don't know what this is." You know, and no will no you know no one else will either. Um, if if I look at something and I think, "Wow, that's a really amazing piece of work," but you know, publisher A, B, C, and D would totally get this, then, you know, then I pass. Well, do you think that over, since you started the press, was it 13 years ago, has your, has your focus changed at all? I mean, or has it broadened or uh, in some way different from the way you conceived of it in the beginning? Well, it's always, it's always about sort of this image, text, visual, literary, art, literature, space, in between space. Um, and, and it changes just sort of in how I interpret that. And Siglio is just me. So I'm really part of it, finding the things that I feel like will be rich and occupy me for a couple of years and thereafter. So I'm not going to ever take a book on that I don't think I won't be excited about. Like, I pick up the Nancy book by Joe Brainerd 13 years later, and I love that book. So, um, you know, I'm my change. Hopefully I've changed in 13 years 
and learned some things and have new questions. So Siglio has changed too in that way, I think. Um, maybe we should go to the chat right now. Anya, are you going to be reading the chat questions or? Yes, yeah, we have some um, questions um, from the audience if you wanna move into a Q and A. Uh, our first question is from Charlie Reskin. Um, if you're uh, here, you should be able to uh, unmute yourself. Um, okay. I can read for Charlie because I don't know if they're uh, available to speak right now, but Charlie asks, um, or says Bernadette Mayer is included in Beauty is a Verb, an anthology about disabilities. Uh, they're curious as to the relation between memory as a publishing project and disability studies. I don't know. I, I couldn't say. I, I actually couldn't answer that. I mean, I, that anthology may be um, work that was post, she had a stroke, uh, in the 90s. So maybe that work that's in the anthology came after that. This works from 1972, mm. 71. Okay. Thank you. Um, our next uh, question comes from um, the Rails very own Malvika. Hi. Um, I just wanted to thank you both uh, um, for this conversation. This has been incredible. I um, actually have two questions and I'm sort of at a loss for which to ask. Um, ask them both. Okay, all right, great, <laughs> it's my show now. Um, okay, well, my first question is for you, Lisa. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for coming on. This has been like just such a delight. Um, and I, I especially like, I loved the essay that you'd written a while back where you sort of described like Mulan Kundera's like unbearable lightness. Uh, like during the Velvet Revolution it, and it being kind of formally like completely the same, like, you know, un unrecognizable from like the restaurant menus, like for dumplings, just as, as like a material object. And this is kind of more of a general question beyond Siglio, but it, I've like felt for some time that you must be like um, a lover of objects and like a collector of things and just like one of the most fascinating people in the world. So I'm sort of curious, um, like, what are you excited about right now? Like, what are you into? Not to make you feel like Oprah's like favorite things, but um, yeah, like I, I sort of like beyond upcoming publications, like is there- Oh my God, there's, there's yeah. nothing. <laughs> there is, there is, my life is Siglio 24 seven right now. And the monotony of being in upstate New York um, during the pandemic has not given me an opportunity to you know, uh, engage with a lot of things. I mean, I, I, I'm, that's very sweet and kind of you to imagine me that way. Um, I, I love books, like that's what fills my house. Um, and I have all kinds of lovely objects that friends have given me. And, but, you know, I don't, you know, I, I, I think I, I'm always sort of thinking about what I'm doing here. And I wish I had more time to, to be an adventurer in the world. And maybe I will be set free from <laughs> the, the prison that is my barn at the moment when this pandemic is over and be nourished again by the kinds of things that I imagine that you're imagining me <laughs> looking at. <laughs> okay, great. Um, should I ask my second question? It's a little, um, Anya, okay. Uh, okay, well, I had a question that sort of came to mind when we were looking at the Sophie Call, the address book, and I wanted to ask you both, actually. Um, so it sort of occurred to me that, like, you know, the projects that she does, and obviously we're not interviewing her, so we can only speculate, but they kind of rely on a kind of anonymity and, like, synchronicity that, like, the city cannot necessarily offer us anymore. Um, you know, this sort of like idea of her projects coming out of like this idea that you can live in incredibly close proximity with strangers and then through like material accidents, uh, gain access into their lives. And, you know, I just feel like that brand of voyeurism isn't necessarily available in the same ways, um, you know, just because you can like scroll through someone's Venmo, transaction histories, their social media, a variety of 
non-material uh, voyeurisms are already sort of published. Um, and I sort of wanted to ask, like, if we weren't looking at Sophie Call's work that sort of came out of the 1980s, you know, where do we find that feeling? Like, what would the equivalent project be, you know, like that in today's life and world? Like, what does that look like, that voyeurism of the address book? Well, you know, I, I, well, I, I, I thought a lot about that actually in relationship to Bernadette's work in memory and with, with Sophie's because they predate social media in really interesting ways, I think. I mean, I think you're absolutely right that Sweet Vinitienne and her other following pieces in the address book would be impossible now. First of all, people don't have address books. Um, and with Sweet Vinitienne, if somebody's taking photographs and posting them, you know where they are. You don't need to go search for them. You could locate them. Um, and with, with Bernadette, she's really you know, documenting her life in a way that I think a lot of people do now through social media. So I guess the question really is who's using those forms in really interesting ways? And you know, I, I don't know right now, but I'm sure that um, and I have to say of the 200 queries that came in, very few used social media as some kind of force in the work. There were a few, and, but not, not as many as you might expect, which also is an interesting question, you know. Connie, did you have any thoughts? Has anything hit your radar? Well, I knew that Sophie would find a way. <laughs> yeah, well, Sophie always finds a way. <laughs> will be undeterred by this. <laughs> well, and she's done, you know, she's done other things too. I mean, yeah, there was that show that was at the Musée de Chausse a couple years ago. Um, I mean, she's always looking and probing yeah. and, yeah. you know. I have full confidence that you'll- Me you'll too. <laughs> Me too. Well, thank you both so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, our next uh, comment comes from Ron Padgett. Um, oh, Ron's here. Ron. <laughs> Hi, Ron. Hi, Ron. Where are you, Ron? I had to get unmuted there. Okay. <laughs> Hi. I, I, uh, I just wanted to say two things. First of all, to thank you both for, and to thank the Brooklyn Rail for this, this wonderful conversation. I mean, really, I'm, I'm, I get bored pretty easy, but. <laughs> Not a second in this whole thing. It was really fascinating. Thank you both. And uh, it shows, I think you're both national monuments, in other words. So thank you. <laughs> um, as far as the, uh, my uh, exaggerated praise goes, <laughs> uh, I want to suggest about the Sophie Kyle book that it would, might be interesting to read uh, her, book, her address book um, in parallel with a more, much more recent book that uh, that uh, called Finding Dora Mar. Oh yeah. Uh, and there's a French uh, woman named Brigitte uh, Boncamoun uh, found an address book. It didn't have a name on it, but she decided to try to find out wh whom it belonged to. And she, because she opened it up and in this address book, she found incredible names, Andre oh, Breton, yeah. on and on and on. All, all the names in, in, in uh, Dora Mar's address book. And so uh, eventually she went around and contacted as many of the people as she could. And it did lead her to Dora Mar, who was still alive. And, and then she got to know Dora Mar. And uh, anyway, it's an interesting book called Finding Dora Mar. Uh, I think the Getty published it recently and uh, it was translated very well by the poet Jody Gladding. So I wanted to recommend the idea of reading those two books in tandem. It might be, might be fun. That's Thank great. You. Ron, That's I'm all. so happy to see you. Yeah. <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> okay, that's enough for me. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Uh, the next question actually is from me. Um, I'm just thinking about the, well, first of all, I just, I, I so admire the mission statement of Siglio as uh, fiercely independent and uh, with a feminist ethos. I'm mean, just thinking about the incredible work you do. Uh, I mean, just wearing so many hats um, at Siglio. Um, so I'm just, I, I, I agree with Ron. I've just been enthralled this entire conversation. Um, and so it got me thinking about 
kind of this current monopolization we're seeing in publishing, especially, you know, with uh, Penguin Random House having merged in 2019, and then the dominance of Amazon as a bookseller right now. Um, and some have expressed alarm um, and think of this consolidation as a threat to freedom of expression. So I'm just thinking about the, the ethos of Siglio and, and wondering how um, Siglio positions itself against the centralization of publishing um, as a publishing house with you know, more uncommon feminist books with maybe more dangerous ideas or ideas that would be dangerous to the mainstream and wondering what your independence has allowed for um, that a larger publishing house might not. Um, you know, where you can push um, there. Right. That's a great question. And, and, you know, I am not alone in this. There are hundreds of really interesting, amazing small presses, each with, you know, that are kindred spirits um, in sort of staying outside of corporate publishing. And, you know, what it allows all of us to do is to be nimble, to be idiosyncratic, to, um, you know, corporate publishing makes a lot of decisions based on their sort of knowledge of their demographics and what they think will be appealing to those demographics. Whereas the rest of us in independent publishing choose things that we love, that we think need to be advocated for and, um, you know, an audience cultivated for. And that takes a lot of work. And, you know, like that stamp on my desk, it is a losing battle. Um, you know, Amazon, you know, I'm, 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 I'm banished from talking about Amazon uh, at family dinners and in company <laughs> outside of, uh, you know, my, my immediate milieu, um, because I, I, I despise Amazon and everything that they do. And what I do tell people, I think often, Younger people um, don't know this, you know, when you, when I'm in a book fair and people come up and they look at the books and they start to take pictures and then they say, oh, I'll get this on Amazon. I explain to them very kindly that if they bought this book on Amazon, um, that, and if all the books were bought on Amazon, then Siglio no longer exists yeah. because they demand such a big discount from my distributor, which, you know, then I get a percentage of, and it wouldn't pay for the books because the, the margins are razor thin. You know, all of my, you know, when you look at a retail price of a book, for me, my production costs, because I want the books to, to be special and to, and to be beautiful and, um, you know, object-like, that production cost is a much bigger percentage of the retail price than would be for a Penguin book. You know, because they also publish thousands of them, whereas I might publish a thousand or maybe two thousand. Um, is that the average run, Lisa? Well, a thousand is sort of the minimum, although it is what it is. Uh, all the cards issued for Donald Trump, because it's five volumes, it's probably going to be a smaller print run than a thousand, because it's just so huge and unwieldy. The project, um, but mo mostly, I my minimum is a thousand. The largest print run I've done at one time is 4,000. Um, wow. and, and, but I do multiple printing. So like, you know, Tantra Song, I print two or 3,000 at a time. I've sold probably over 10,000 copies of that book. Meanwhile, I have books that I've sold 300 copies of, you yeah. know, and some of those books are my favorite books. Um, yeah. And the ones that I work really hard to get into the world. And I, you know, I have one book called Eternal Friendship uh, by a French author named Anouk Durin that was translated by Elizabeth Zuba. And it is this very circuitous story told through archival images of an Albanian propaganda photographer who when he was a young partisan, his family saved a family of Jews from the Nazis. And, um, and it's told through this trip to China. And it is a really funky, weird, interesting, beautiful, book and really quiet and really unassuming. I think I have met every single person who owns that book. What's the name of that book? Eternal Friendship right? by Anouk Durin. And, and I, people come up to me at book fairs and say, I love this book. And I'm like, oh, I, let me come out and hug you. Because <laughs> I know, you know, you're, you're person number 185. <laughs> um, so that's the difference really between me and corporate publishing, Anya, is, you know, that, that these books mean something to me and, and to every other small press publisher, you know, I mean, there's 
Ugly Duckling and Dorothy and Future Poem and Litmus and you know Atlas Press. And I mean, there's just, I did a pop-up at the MoMA store um, for the last few months of this year. And, you know, my, all of my books were on one side, but on the other side was this sort of rotating selection of other small press publishers um, who I really admire. And there were ones I didn't, I couldn't include because they weren't sort of doing image text work. Um, but, you know, the Song Cave and, you know, I mean, I could shout out to any number of presses, other presses who I admire, who also have you know, if not the similar editorial interests in image and text, but definitely a similar ethos in risk taking and espousing and advocating for work that that the commercial marketplace would just outright ignore. Yeah. Thank you so much for such a thoughtful answer. I appreciate that. Um, our next question comes from Aaron Kim. Um, and to be able to uh, unmute yourself. Hi. Um, I don't know if I should turn on my video. Okay. Hello. Um, I have a question about. Uh, I, I love how you're kind of open with the with your queries of, of whoever may have you know something to share. I'm just curious with the the last year and um, the rumblings of 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 seeing injustice and uh, disrepresentation and things like that, what your current thoughts or reflections or um, what your process is towards processing that um, and representing, amplifying marginalized voices. Um, yeah, I, I love your work and I think there's great power to, to what you do. So I just wanted to, to see what, how you approach that. Yeah, that's a great question. and and. I have to say that I really, you know, did a lot of soul searching and, and, and thought a lot this summer about that. And I've always felt like my mission has been to, to advocate for work on the margins and whether that work is, um, you know, identity based, you know, in terms of race or uh, gender orientation, um, sexual orientation or whether it's, um, you know, the ways in which people see the world. So, you know, all of those things come into play for me. And in terms of, um, you know, I, I feel like representation, whether it is in racial terms or gender terms um, is really important. Um, and I'm always keeping a really open, uh, open net, very wide net to look for the things that, um, uh, not only that I'm interested in, but I'm also, in, you know, I'm also very aware of, of trying to gravitate towards the things that make me uncomfortable and that are unfamiliar to me. And that's a part of the ethos as well. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, thank you for, for your thoughts. <laughs> You. Uh, our next question comes from our very own Nick. Uh, um, thank you, Anya, and, and thank you, Lisa and, and Connie, so much for this wonderful conversation. Uh, we love books, so this has been a pleasure. Um, my question is, is kind of related in a way to what Anya asked, so you've kind of already touched on it, Lisa, but I'm just kind of curious in general, like how um, you've seen publishing change since you started Siglio and and maybe how book fairs kind of play a role in how people interact with with books much more than they used to um and I, I was where I was going to kind of ask about what would you like to see the future of it being you kind of touched on in the response to what Amazon does to books but uh if there's anything left there uh, I would love to know um yeah how you've seen the landscape kind of change over time Right. Well, I think when I started Siglio, I was really responding to a landscape that was um, very segregated by genre and medium. And, you know, there were art books and there's literary books. There was corporate publishing and there was small press publishing. And about the time I started Siglio, I think the Printed Matter Art Book Fair was in its second or third year. Um, and I think, and, and, and also at that moment, 
people were sounding the death knell for the printed book too. You know, this is the advent of eBooks and digital platforms and, you know, so it was a sort of very strange moment to be pushing. I felt like the moment was really, it was a necessary moment. Like the thing that, that I always say, like young people, people who come to me and say, I want to do something. I want to start a publishing house. My first question is always, well, what's not out there that you think should be, you know, whose voices aren't being heard? What do you want to read that you can't access? That's what you make the space for. So for me, it was this in between space um, of art and literature. Um, but I feel like because of uh, technology. So I do all of my design and production management at my computer in this barn, um, you know, which makes it really easy. I can, I can, I can print, I can distribute. I, you know, I have tools that are available to me that 15, 20 years ago, the equivalent would be a mimeograph machine and saddle stitching for a zine, you know, that you then got out to sort of your locality. So that's changed in a way that affords a really different set of opportunities. And I think in the 10 years since then, that's only gotten much more vibrant. I think the world of independent publishing, of independent artists book publishing, of literary independent publishing has really grown. And I think that we're in a slight danger now, well, it might be more than slight, but this pandemic has really moved everything online. And the part of this, ecosystem that is in danger are independent bookstores, which they are the ones who point readers to new things that they may not discover through an algorithm that they may not find, you know, because it's gotten a lot of press. Um, and that is the thing that worries me the most, actually. So book fairs will play a very special role for the people who are excited enough about books to go to those fairs, or they're lucky enough to have them in their communities. But independent bookstores are really the, they're, they're what, you know, once the seed's in the ground, they're the ones who make it grow. Because, you know, uh, without them, I really fear for the future, quite honestly. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you for everything you do. Oh, thanks. And thanks for having me. I mean, this is, I mean, I'm going to go retreat back into my barn now after everybody's been so nice to me and I'm going to live on this <laughs> for weeks on end. <laughs> I'm going to just have to come back and just like play clips um, and that will keep me going. <laughs> well, yeah, it has been so wonderful <laughs> to hear. Um, and we have another question uh, from Mark Block. Uh, you should be able to turn on your microphone. Hi. Hi, Lisa. Hey, Mark. How are you? I'm good. Thanks, uh, Constance, also, and of course, the Brooklyn Rail. I just, in the context of what you were just saying, I thought of your amazing um, book about the, uh, Dick Higgins and the Something Else Press. So I thought I would just give you a chance to talk about that because it was such a, an important press. And it's sort of, in my mind, whenever I go to the Printed Matter Book Fair, I always think of Dick Higgins and that very small community that grew into this mega, always hot, always crowded, giant extravaganza. It used to be a tiny little community. So I just thought right. maybe you'd want to talk about Dick Higgins. Uh, well, Mark, thank you for teeing me up for that because, because Dick is, for those of you who don't know about Dick Higgins, he was the founder and impresario behind the Something Else Press, which really was the very first press to... Um, create sort of trade editions of artist books. So Dick's great, one of his many um, accomplishments was to, to really subvert the mechanisms of, of trade publication, which means books that are made uh, offset to be distributed widely and, and use those to deliver the avant-garde almost to unsuspecting souls. <laughs> um, so Dick's a, Dick is, so much a presiding spirit over Siglio and um, so much of what he has written about in this book that Steve Clay, who's the publisher of Granary Books, who published I Remember and who um, has also been a mentor to me. Um, and he's published many, many wonderful books. He and Ken Friedman edited Intermedia Fluxus and the Something Else Press uh, Selected Writings by Dick Higgins, which was a big 356 page 
compendium of, of Dick's writings, including a full catalog of all the something else press books and ephemera. I mean, it's an amazing book. And do I have it on my desk? I, I don't have my copy on my desk to show, but it's completely dog-eared and tons of little stickers in it because it's my go-to book. Um, and he, there is no Siglio without Dick Higgins at all. I mean, I, I have taken so many cues from him and, um, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, there'll be a few Siglio titles that have the same sort of influence and longevity that many of his have, have had. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we have to start winding down, but we do have uh, one final question um, from uh, our publisher at The Rail, Fong Wei. Um, if you'd like to turn on your mic. Thank you, Lisa. Oh, thanks, Fong. Thank you, Connie. And uh, it's so nice to see also Ron Padgett. Is he still here? One of our great poets. Always admire his work so much. Great friend of Bill Bergson, the late Bill Bergson, who was super influential to the rail also when he was a guest critic on September issue. I can be wrong with the date, Nick. Would you check and put in the chat? I believe it may have been in 2013, uh, maybe 12 earlier. Bill was so amazing, um, had a, a, a profound voice, I would say. And I remember clearly his editorial was simply, please write the experiences, either by poetic rapport to the work of what you have seen, or you write it as almost physically describe what you saw. And it's just to me, it's so perfect for what we do the rail, but I wanted to, Congratulate you, Lisa, uh, partly because of that ripple effects of what we do. Small press, um, I must say that the seven arts that was published 1916 to 17, only 10 issue, one year it existed. Uh, the publisher was Annette Rankin. It's interesting too that you mentioned earlier about many women who were published of those small press, which of course, uh, bring to mind uh, the great Virginia Woolf mm -hmm. and her husband, Leonard, who started Hogarth Press, which named up their home, of course, um, in Surrey, and that was 1907. And that essentially was created in order to publish her own work through the Lighthouse, and of course, those are the member of the Bloomsbury Group. It was an incredible immersive publication of I would say Clyde Bell, for example, uh, Roger Fry, who wrote on criticism, and then John Maynard Keynes on economic theories, and then there was Desmond McCarthy, D.S. Eliot, Catherine Manfield. It goes on, the list was amazing. Of course, I can't help but think of Silver Beach, the founder of Shakespeare and Company, who also published James Joyce and uh, Andre Gide and Pound and other people. But to go back to Seven Arts, even though it's one year, it published, it has significant influence in the rail, simply because it's the first time that it really brought together the Seven Arts, you know? Mm -hmm. And I never thought of it, came through it very gradually. And then it became a, a kind of philosophical framework editorially and what the rail is about. But I wanted to share with you something very precious uh, so, one of my great uncle translated this book, The Grand Monde by Alan Fournier. For those of you who haven't read it, it's uh, roughly translated into English called The, the, uh, the Grandera. Mm -hmm. But this is a correspondent here, published by Gallimard. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's 20 something, 23, I think. The correspondent between Alan Fournier and um, the, the great right playwright, Jacques Prévert, who also wrote the script for Children of Paradise, Le Enfant de Paradis, remember? That was made during the war. And it was through that that created this book. Four years later, by this uh, incredible um, translator, personality named Francois de Lis. The reason why I know all this because uh, the painter, Bob Ryman, the late great painter, Bob Ryman and his wife, um, Meryl Wagner, their home 
is actually is the, the, the former clinic of uh, Margaret Sanger, who first created the, the, the abortion clinic in America. So she was a friend of Margaret Ta uh, Sanger. Isn't that amazing? That how this thing came about, this book, and then eventually led to this own so, which I want to share with you. Uh, the Little Man Press, Charles Henry Ford, the publisher of View Magazine. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So all of these things have a significant influence the rail. You know how we see things. Uh, it's just like uh, uh, Ezra Pound once say, you know, in order to understand a deep novel, you must have lived at least one of his chapters. So book is really part of our alchemy for those who love culture, not just literary culture, but the art and everything in between, you know? Uh, so thank you for being here with us and sharing all this amazing effort that you do with Seagull Press. And uh, thank you, Connie, for being yeah. such a gracious host and brilliant as you always are. And uh, the rest is just try to keep everything together. I think yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're so we're, 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 <laughs> I mean, this is this is what we do. So yeah. we have to keep it together, and this is our arsenal in terms of culture and the arts against the ignorant and the bombastic aggression against everything we do, and we have to do it coming together. Yes. On. So this is great energy building up for tomorrow inauguration. So thank you so much. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you and everybody at the rail. Thank you. Thank you, Fong, for that historical context and, and bringing, linking what the rail does and what Siglia does. I think it's really important. Um, and thank you, Connie and Lisa, for such a wonderful conversation today. Um, right now, we're going to move into the conclusion of our program. Um, at the rail, we've had a tradition of ending um, lunches with a poem, um, and we've carried that tradition into these community events, um, these digital events. Uh, so today, I'm thrilled to welcome our poet laureate, Adam DeGraff, uh, to the stage. Uh, DeGraff's most recent book is Wherewithal, edited by Ansel, uh, Anselm Berrigan. Um, he hosts the Kith and Kin reading series in Astoria, Queens with Tyler Burba teaches poetry at St. Francis Prep in Fresh Meadows, Queens, and with Genevieve George, looks after two daughters in Sunnyside, Queens. So Adam, um, the floor is yours. All right, thanks Catherine, appreciate it. Um, it's nice to see everybody here. Uh, I'm, at, I'm still, I'm teaching now, so I had to, uh, I had to reserve the, the um, conference room above the library at St. Francis Preparatory School here in Queens um, to, to read for you all. But uh, I love the Brooklyn Rail. Fong, I love the work you do. I love your drawings, especially. I, I feel like they're very important drawings. Um, and I want to start with a poem that was in the rail a couple of years ago. And uh, basically, this one's for Connie. Um, it's called Blonde Nimbus. Last night I went to see Blonde Redhead with Tyler. I was mourning the death of Bill Berkson and didn't really want to go. Blonde Redhead though? O'Hara spelled blonde with an E as well. And Bill was a major blonde for O'Hara. And so on the blonde tip, I decided to go. In the car over, apropos of nothing, Tyler starts talking about this short story by Kafka called Silence of the Sirens, wherein he said, Odysseus, instead of stopping up the ears of his crew, stops up his own and listens. I thought of that Keats line, heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. And that's what happened too, because we missed Blonde Redhead altogether, arrived just as the show was ending. A moment of silence. Instead, we went to a little bar called Sonny's. In the back room, a sorry ass band was playing Hank Williams songs. 
which was so much better, I could cry. Um, this next one is just called, it's, it was also in the rail a few years ago. It's called Cue the Music. And uh, well, it's of a certain style. Okay, what I was saying was, so my nieces, when they were young, Jamaica, and then Irie as well, and their little brother Dante, we would go on these walks and we would sing everything that would happen. And they were like these little musicals. And I felt like I was living inside a musical at that time. And I would think, well, this is possible for the future. This is a possible future. Everything being musical. And then not too long ago on Facebook, Jamaica, who's now like 22, I think, she said she watched Greece for the first time and liked the idea of, she said, what happened to musicals? Why don't we have musicals more often? So that led me to remember this time when we were young and everything was a musical. And I often think about what it would be like if we were, we were living inside music all the time, both in our movement and in our so-called speech, you know, dancing and singing constantly. And you know that that's a possible, that that could happen. That's a possible iteration in the future, although maybe way in the future um, for society. But for myself personally, I think it's a worthwhile goal, which I think about sometimes when I'm dancing in the morning like how to extend that dance all day long. And I haven't been as musical lately as I used to be. I haven't had the time to practice, although I need to get back into it because I want to also extend that. Uh, so I'm working on a book right now. It's called, it's probably just gonna be called Dance Journal, but it's, um, it's, it's going to be basically a journal of a thousand and one dances. And I'm up to about 580 now dances, um, but I'm putting them together. I put the first 250 journal entries into, um, into a manuscript that I'm kind of working on right now. But these are a few from that. This is uh, the 11th dance, 11th dance. Spastic pop and lock to tame Impala birth of a new style. The dancing is happening between the lines. Read between the lines. The words themselves are beautiful hieroglyphics on an eggshell. Subcutaneous scrimshaw. The yoke's on you. When you see yourself nowhere, you see yourself everywhere. Dance number 54. Some mornings I want greatness to have it all, to be on the love boat, exciting and new. On other days like today, I'm just lucky to barely step inside the dance. Certainly the older I get, the more difficult it is to fly. But I keep testing my wings in order to keep them sharp. That's a terrible metaphor. <laughs> One terrible black squirrel this morning faced me down. Subtract any ominous metaphor, and what you have left is a beautiful black squirrel. That's great. Dance number 73. This is back from July 7, 2013. I dance listened to Terrasonic. It was so good, I listened to it again. I wouldn't have known not to regret it. A dappled dawn drawn falcon, ragamuffin brown and white, she swooped in from a tree in the cemetery. And then a formation of barn swallows making parabolas around the tree. It fills me with joy. Following the parabola of the hawk, I think of Thomas Pynchon's penchant for parabolas. I've never read Thomas Pynchon. The hawk is chasing the barn swallows. He is a bit ungainly, but sure, in his magisterial swoop. The swallows are quick, the swallows are quick and elusive. I would have missed all that had I stayed in bed this morning. It's from January 2nd of that year. 
dance from Eddie Berrigan's WebMD office to MoMA to see Christian Marclay's The Clock. Dancing down 49th Street, I'm a Broadway dancer in a reality show on the silver screen. It's the perfect warm up act. Everyone on the street is dancing. I will be thinking about the clock for a long time. I want to take my great, great, great grandkids to see it soon. I'm looking at you, great grandkids. After spending an hour there, I went to see a James Ensor illustration of a true story involving baboons burning on a chandelier to the brothers Quay freak out over Velvet Underground alternative cuts. Tell you what to do. Run, 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 run down Fifth Avenue. All right, it's the last one. This is dance number 79. I rode the bike to Central Park and locked it up to the Southeast side. There I saw the most subtle ballet you can imagine. I was listening to Coco Rosie's song, Beautiful Boys in my headphones. And there came this moment in time to the music when two construction workers picked up and turned orange pylons at the same time, but from opposite directions. They did it in a way that could have only been choreographed, but of course it wasn't. It was straight up out of Edwin Denby. All right, there's some dance poems for you, some uh, poems about dancing, which I suppose is a bit like uh, dancing about architecture, but. Anyway, there you go. Thanks for inviting me. Much, Adam. That was wonderful. I love the idea of life being a musical. I've asked, I've asked that question myself. <laughs> why, why aren't there more musicals? Um, yeah. And thank you so much, Connie and Lisa, for such a wonderful conversation. And everyone who asked uh, questions um, and, and came today. Um, this has been lovely. Um, and just to note that this October um, marked the Rails 20th anniversary and we'll be celebrating that all the way into 2021. Um, so please consider making a year end contribution to keep the rail and our special projects um, like the NSE lunchtime series uh, relevant and independent. Um, every amount matters to us. Um, our goal is to double last year's participation and reach 500 donors. So check out the chat uh, for more information or you can ask one of our teams. Uh, and you can join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a radical poetry reading with Leila Chatti, featuring political poetry read by Dorian Locks, Benjamin Garcia, Hala Alian, and Safia El Hilo. And you can now um, turn on your microphones and say thank you and goodbye. Right there. Thanks, Adam. Thank you again, Lisa and Connie. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, it was so it was fun. So Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Maddie and Lisa. Uh, Such a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Joining Ron. Hey, Richard. Hi, Ron. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> Happy New Year, Ron. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.